Today I'm going to talk about Flexbox, but before that I have a question for you. Who here has ever felt the pain of fixing a layout and just feeling that they'd have no idea about what's happening? It's just some kind of magic uh, which are making things move around. So raise your hand if you've ever felt that pain. Yeah. Well, I've got some good news. Things are getting way better. So I'm Guillaume Hamadi. Um, forget about the spelling of the name, it's Guillaume. And uh, I moved to Australia a year and a half ago. I'm French. Um, and uh, I used to work at abrilestate.com.au and just started recently with Envato. Uh, when I am not writing software, I'm a part-time photographer. My portfolio is blackrockstudio.com and I do treat, tweet sorry, random ideas and sketches on G. Hamity. Feel free to have a look. So, what's on the menu tonight? I'll start with the history of web layout. Uh, the few options that we've had in the last 10 years, 15 years, to layout pages. Then I'll actually explain what's Flexbox, or at least what I understand of it, which is probably not the whole story. And I'll finish with some coding examples with actual live coding, and if the gods of demo are with me, that will be fine. If not, well, that's going to be a catastrophe. So, let's start with a short history of web layout. Boo. Tables. Um, <laughs> late 90s, uh, I actually never worked with that. I started working later than they arrived. But they were still like known as some kind of like the demonic option. Um, why are they bad? They are bad because they are non-semantic. Tables are fine to display tabular data. You don't want to use that for laying out a page, but that's what people decided that they would do. And uh, that just blossomed in an incredible amount of um, layouts that would be, you take an image, you just cut slices in it, and you just chunk these slices into the table cells, and here you go, you have a layout. Good luck with making this evolve. Floats. When I started eight years ago, that's, that was the, the, the big guy. It still is quite used on a very regular basis for layouts. Um, it's okay, you can do quite crazy and quite nice stuff with floats, but it has lots of cave heats. Um, for me, the biggest one is that in order to use um, CSS layout efficiently uh, with floats, you have to have a really good understanding of two big CSS concepts, which are um, the box model, how do blocks and inline elements uh, behave in the page, what are the, the rules, um, and then the other one is the notion of page flow, uh, the basic idea that goes from top to bottom, but there's um, there's a few side effects that you should be aware of when you start playing with like advanced float tricks. Anyway, it's kind of moving um, now. It's not that many layouts purely based on float anymore uh, because this guy, um, which already existed like eight years ago, it was I think part of like the CSS2 specification. Um, I was very happy when I started discovering it and I played around with it and I was like, yeah, that's cool. I can achieve these complex things very easily. And then I was like, yeah, but there's no support whatsoever in IE6 and a few more players at that time. So it was like, forget about it, fix it in another way, thanks. So the idea of inline block is that um, it gives you kind of best of both, wor both, both words, worlds, sorry, between inline elements, which are just going to flow one next to each other until there's space and until it reaches the end of the viewport and then goes to the next line. Um, but it, the inline elements don't give you control to their height and width. Um, to have this kind of control, you use blocks, but then blocks by default, they'll take the whole horizontal space and um, uh, as much vertical space as the content is. So inline block brings everything together, gives you uh, the property to be nicely displayed next to each other, and gives you direct control of height and width. It's pretty cool. But there's also some problems if you start having to implement crazy designs coming from uh, graphic designers who have no idea about how the web is built. Anyway, um, here comes Flexbox. It's going to bring a lot of nice things. It's um, the future. Sorry. Actually, it's not the future. It's here today. Why? 
because of these two figures. Um, the support for Flexbox is much better than what people expect. It's these stats, I haven't created them, they are from caniuse.com. If you have never heard about it, use it. Um, and so 95% worldwide of support and 97% specifically in Australia. That's, that's great. So obviously, depending on your business, these stats may change a bit, but it definitely is uh, time to have a look at Flexbox. And if there's one thing I would like you guys to remember tonight is use it. It's ready. The browsers out there support Flexbox. It's not 100%, it's not everyone, it's not without side effects, but it is here. This is not a prototype anymore. Um, so, common questions with uh, that. Um, what about the two or three different syntaxes of Flexbox which were released during the process from the W3C? What about vendor-specific uh, prefixes? What about support for IE9? Well, you should not really ask, the, well, you should not really try to fix these things by hand. Really, what you should do is use uh, some best practices. So, get yourself a build pipeline, get yourself inside the build pipeline an auto prefixer. So, just to give you an idea, a build pipeline is something that runs in the background or runs when you push your code somewhere, which is going to do lots of like boring automated tasks for you. So, instead of writing four Flexbox selectors, um, with like each of the browser vendor prefixes, you just write the standard one, the one that's already in the W3C spec, and you let the auto prefixer do its job. You define which browsers you want to support, which versions of like Safari, Firefox you want to support, and the auto prefixer knows the rules, is updated on a regular basis, and its job is to actually fix these kind of problems. Um, the only cave hit for that is if you have to support IE um, before 10 and Safari before 7 then the auto prefixer can't do anything for you because it's not a question of which syntax was implemented. Um, it's just, it doesn't work at all. In this case, my favorite approach is to not support it at all. But if you have to support it because of business reasons, which are completely valid, by the way, um, I'd highly recommend you push, um, you come with the, uh, the, the stats as an argument and you explain that it's, get a simpler design which is quicker to implement for these guys on these old browsers and focus on delivering value for 95 or 97% of your users. Pretty much more important, I think. Um, so by the way, supporting this, um, the Flexbox um, specification today is at the stage called by the W3C, the last call working draft. So that should give us pretty much enough confidence um, that the spec is not going to change wildly before it goes to uh, not draft state anymore. So, that's cool, we can use it, but what is it? I'm not sure I want to try to read this, but that's the whole, the heavy, thick W3C definition. Instead, I'm going to try with my hands and with a metaphor that I actually quite like. So, Flexbox works with um, container and items. So, just think about like a cardboard box and you would see, you would look at the cardboard box from the, fr from the, from, from the front. Um, get a thread between the two sides of your cardboard box, start horizontally, we'll see afterward that it can move, but start horizontally, and hang your items on this thread. So what you are going to have some control on and what Flexbox is going to also have some control is the ability to move the items along this thread. Or even, if you have lots of items, get the thread to kind of magically go one line after the other, and move the elements on that. Um, another important concept is um, of the, the, ax the axis. The, um, the flex box has a main direction called the main axis, which is by default um, horizontal, and which is in countries which have by default left to right um, writing and uh, flow in the web is going to also be left to right. And the cross axis is the vertical one, top to bottom. Um, one cool thing is with one line of CSS, you can switch this, which, for example, a very useful place for this is imagine you have your nice desktop, um, you've got a layout with some columns, um, and your content is spread all around the width of the uh, viewport, and then when you move to your mobile phone, you want some responsiveness, with one line of code, you can change the axis, switch main and cross axis, and all of a sudden, you've got a nice vertical layout 
which fits perfectly on a mobile phone. So, time to give you some examples. We'll start with the markup. So our example is this guy on the left. Uh, pretty simple. Um, it's just one container with a class of flex container, which is just a div. can be any, anything, really. And five other divs inside. I just added like uh, five more, but they are commented out, so they don't appear. That was just for like a previous example that I'm actually not going to run. Um, so, divs by default with no uh, specific style. They take the whole width, then they pile up on top of each or on the bottom of each other. So, flexbox starts like this: display flex. What happens? Well, they all stack uh, as a row because so. When I start displaying um, my flexbox like this, what happens is that, remember, the thread goes all around horizontally, and that's what happens. The items get stuck um, next to each other. Uh, to be sure that you understand what's happening, let's have a look at the, co at the flex container. It's not just around these elements. Um, it actually takes the full width. And that's one difference with an interesting property, which is display flex or display inline flex. So that's pretty much the same difference as between a block and an inline block, if you reload the page. So instead of taking the whole width available, it shrinks back to the width of the content. Um, so two things which are commonly very hard to realize with the previous techniques um, in uh, CSS are vertical centering and flexible of, um, and sorry, and vertical centering in a flexible content, so we don't really know what the height of the window is going to be, but we still want the thing to always be vertically centered. Good luck to do this without Flexbox. The other one is sticking a footer all the way down your viewport, whatever the height of the content is. So these historic tricks are basically a piece of cake with um, a Flexbox. How it works? You start with that guy. So justify content is the property which is going to manage the display of your elements on the main axis. So once again, if you remember the previous metaphor, that's the, the horizontal thread. So I've just told my box to go her, um, centered. And it doesn't work. Why? Because I'm still in inline flex. Here we go. So that's one. This is not that crazy because we can achieve these kind of things with a good old uh, margin auto. That works fine enough. But what's better is this guy. And still doesn't work. Why? Because the thing is, as you can see with the green uh, border around, the flex container is still just the height of your um, elements. So if you just check this height of 100% for the container, then all of a sudden you get no more content than these five little cards, and they are perfectly vertically centered. Um, and that's just going to keep working whatever the height of the thing is. I can even go further. That's kind of the same approach to get the footer stuck all the way down. And the value name is flex end. So I, I don't know the whole Flexbox API by heart. I've just, I just know a few which are useful. And there's also like really good documentation that I will point uh, at the end of this presentation. But uh, typically, that's nice. Once again, no content. But I can still position my element wherever I want. And it's going to respect. Um, the position of the elements. And I can even go a bit further. If I want my, ele my elements, instead of looking like this um, little list uh, stuck in the middle of my page at the bottom, I can actually make it take all the available space. How do I do this? The name of the property is flex grow. And I'll explain what this value is, because it is not a standard CSS unit. It's not like an EM or a pixel or percent percent anything. It's an integer which is used as like a multiplier. Um, with other elements. I'm going to explain this in a second. Just bear with me. So now, uh, each of the items, um, the whole thing takes the whole space. So how does it work? Flex grow, like, let's say, for example, um, I get some specifics for item number four. So I've given. So shrink is just the, the equivalent of grow, but for the other size, when the element starts with a certain dimension and the space gets smaller. So at that stage, we don't really care about it. Um, what happens here is that the item number four just got three times as much of the available space on the sides of my um, flex container 
and he just took three times as much as the other guys. The other guys still took some, but one, when the item four took three. Um, and so you can pretty much control the space very easily with that. Um, I'll just finish with a real life example. Um, I'll explain what the layout is and then I'll show you that it's actually used in production. Um, so this guy is kind of called uh, the holy grail of um, uh, CSS layout. The idea is that we want to achieve um, a fixed height header, fixed height footer, two columns which are going to hit all the way down whatever the content and of constant width and any dynamic available space is given to only one of the boxes. So that's box number four. And so as you can see, nothing else moves, but the content uh, the number four just like gets, um, uh, gets all the flexibility available. It has its own scroll. Um, it doesn't take more space on the whole vertical of the, of the layout. And so where can this be useful? Well, that's actually the last thing I was part of before leaving REA. So typically, that's exactly what I said. We've got header, footer uh, stuck there. The column on the left has quite a lot of content, and it doesn't break the design. When there's actually just a few suburbs available, it doesn't break the design either. The Google Maps still takes all the space. And when you move things around, uh, you can still just get all the controls fine. And um, we did achieve this with Flexbox. Maybe there would have been uh, solutions without Flexbox, but this was by far the quickest option. And so the idea behind this is a cross Flexbox layout. There's actually two Flexboxes here. The first one is um, a colon-based Flexbox with container one, container five, and a wrapper around container two, three, four. And the other one is the actual wrapper is also a Flex container, and it has um, row elements, which are container two, container three, and container four. So it's also live on some places of the marketplace at Envato and in a few other places. This is code which runs in production. There's daily users. Just go read the spec and use it if you don't use it already. This is awesome. This simplifies an incredible number of CSS problems. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Well, that's uh, quite um, an interesting question and that's a very different approach. Um, the thing is that if you use Bootstrap, you're embracing the whole lot of code that's included in Bootstrap. Um, it might be the good answer. It's a quick solution to start. Um, but Bootstrap has also, I haven't used Bootstrap a lot, but that's my kind of limited understanding. It's going to, it might get into your way at some point when you start having to implement fairly complex designs with like really custom specifications. Flexbox is not really a replacement for Bootstrap. I see Flexbox more as a replacement or an addition to the older ways to build layouts all by yourself. Um, yeah, so it's more like you use Bootstrap at the start of a project because that's the best way to focus on your product, on giving customers value without having to have a, too much of a hard time to get a front end which looks like something. But as your product evolves, you may end up having to fight again against the framework. If that happens, you may want to move to a full custom uh, layout solution. And in this case, Flexbox is just one more toolbox that, um, that uh, inline blocks and floats are. Um, and that's when you would start using it. So just as a comment, um, the latest version of Bootstrap can support Flexbox.